First of all, know that the framing within this debate is probably we continue to push with all of the efforts that we are currently doing insofar as they're useful at pushing internationalization. We think it's probably going to work. But two other reasons. First, note that the yuan is the third most traded currency in the world. Around 10% of all foreign currencies are currently in the yuan. So there's just economic pressure and economic incentives for countries to accept this insofar as having foreign reserves allows you to be more liquid in situations of crises, allows you to be competitive in the international markets and have additional money with which you can buy, borrow and trade. I think insofar as the yuan is so traded in, it creates an incentive for countries to accept this. But secondly, note that there is already an incentive for the US and the IMF to accept the internationalization of the yuan insofar as if they want China to stop its currency manipulation efforts, which are currently hugely hurting their economies because they allow China to flood their markets with cheap exports. They have to be able to leverage against China with, um, with something that China gets in return, specifically because China's economy is currently capturing a lot of BRI countries and they want to compete with influence. This means, therefore, that not only is there an incentive for, for the West to do this, but secondly, that if China does stop currency manipulation or at least reduces it, we think it's good for China for a number of reasons. First of all, because currency manipulation in and of itself reduces the influx of FDI into China because it sends an optical message that the government is encroaching onto the economy, but also the economy is likely to be unstable because there's volatility you cannot predict through assessing market forces. Insofar as China is trying to shift to a tertiary sector, IT sector-based economy, this means that they require foreign direct investment to be able to fuel that. But secondly, we say insofar as China is currently trying to shift away from exports and rather to a more sustainable economy, stopping currency manipulation is less likely to cause crisis during the interim period because the Chinese economy currently is not actually quite stable. Due to huge amounts of shadow banking, the coronavirus crisis, artificial housing bubbles, and a number of other reasons, the Chinese economy is prone to failure. Insofar as they're in a transition period, being stopping currency manipulation, or at least reducing it to a certain extent, which I think we have yet for, insofar as the motion presumes we continue the push for internationalization and similar efforts have already been done, is good inherently for China. This is both a benefit in and of itself and proves that the motion is going to happen. Why do we think internationalization is good? couple of reasons. One, we think it increases independence from the West. Insofar as the yuan becomes a global reserve currency, this means that countries can pay off their debts in the yuan. This means that they can trade globally in the yuan. This means it becomes a foreign reserve currency they use in times of crisis. This means that the demand for the yuan goes up and therefore the power of an individual yuan towards other currencies grows. Why do we think this matters? Because it increases the purchasing power of the average Chinese citizen to buy Chinese products within the internal economy. We think having a stable internal economy that can generate both revenue and tax is incredibly important insofar as one, currently the optics in the West towards China are not positive. Biden has said that he's going to continue the hardline stance on China. But secondly, know that China is dependent on Western actions, which is bad in two ways. First of all, any tension between the West and China can result in a trade war and tariffs, which can hugely harm Chinese companies, but not just on the level of industrial exports, Note also how the U.S. stopped doing business with Huawei and Xiaomi, which not only harmed their exports and the amount of money that they get, but also created negative optics, as in the Chinese government is going to spy on us through this technology. This combined with the idea that COVID is a Chinese virus and stuff, creates huge antivirus sentiment. We don't want China to be dependent on goodwill of the United States of America or the West. But lastly, know that even if there were goodwill, you're simply more dependent on volatility and crisis happening within the West insofar as you are tied to the dollar and not your own currency. So when economic crisis hits like 2008 or when COVID hits and it hits more in the West than it did in China, you are also going to be impacted by it unless you're independent in the way that we propose. But secondly, note that the most debt in the status quo, and this is an argument of how we're better able to deal with debt, is denominated in the US dollar because countries are not trusted to pay back debts in their own currency. This means that when investors are determining risk of investing in your country, they hedge against that risk based on the relationship between your currency and the US dollar. In short, trivially, if they don't think you can pay back your debt in dollars, they're unlikely to invest in your country. When the yuan becomes a global reserve currency, this means that China can now borrow in its own currency, can issue bonds in its own currency. This means, therefore, China can have debt denominated in its currency. Why is that important? First of all, because optically, if investors know that you do not have control over the relationship between your currency and another currency, i.e. you cannot control fluctuations, they're less likely to want to invest in the country. This is what happened in the 1990s with most Southeast Asian countries. So for that denominated in the US dollar, investors were unsure whether they're going to be able to, to pay those debts and they actually fled the country. Secondly, we said control in and of itself is a benefit as you're better able to prevent economic crisis and instability. But thirdly, we said you, on, on their side of the house, you just have a significantly larger amount of leverage of the West against 
like China, insofar as they're able to issue speculative attacks against the yuan, for example, like buying, huge, buying off huge amounts of the yuan, therefore, in, therefore increasing the supply and lowering the power of the yuan, insofar, therefore, as China would still have to pay their debts back in dollars, decreasing the power of the yuan makes China less able to pay off its debts, meaning it's more prone to econ economic failure, but also that it's more prone to soft power and diplomatic demands being issued from the West insofar as the West can hold China hostage. On our side of the house, China is more independent in terms of debt and is therefore better able to push its economic interests, but also funnel the money into the BRI, which note are mostly unprofitable projects. Those are not things that grant returns. It's fucking highways in Montenegro. There's no reason for that to be built. You do it because of political control and political hegemony to be able to acquire strategic infrastructure and governmental control. For that to be able, for that to happen, you need to have significant capital Capital reserves that can fi finance unprofitable projects. This can only happen if you are able to access debt without being leveraged against by other countries and without having FDI going away from your country because of the optical reasons that we've mentioned. Lastly, before we explain why this just benefits Chinese business, we're willing to take closing opposition. Yeah, only 30% of China's economy is run by people within China. Everything else is literally FDI. Why do we invest in it now? China's FDI is falling down. So the reason why China's GDP has been slowly, has Chinese GDP growth has been steadily slowing down. It's been a double digit number for a couple of years ago. Now it's no longer a double digit number because economic bubbles are happening in China. Because the things that you are referring to happened before COVID. Because there's a housing bubble that wasn't there before. Because China's trans to against that's to something that's not an ex expert economy is something relatively new. Confidence in China is decreasing. This is not a static motion. Lastly, explain why we think that this is just good for Chinese, for Chinese business. Not if you're a Chinese businessman trying to do business outside of China, for example, in Africa or other Asian countries. You do not want to do business in their currency because you probably believe that developing countries are subject to a lot of volatility and they factually are insofar as they're undiversified economies with low purchasing power and prone to very common crises. This means in the status quo, you probably have to do business in the dollar. This means that the cost of business is vastly increased because you have to exchange your, cur your currency for dollars for another currency, which means there's a double exchange and just increases costs. But this is again compounded additionally by the amount of leverage that the US and other Western countries have against your currency by using currency manipulation against you, which means that they can vastly reduce, vastly increase the cost of business for China in countries like Africa, which makes it harder for China to take commodities from those countries, to export those countries, and to cement its political control, which is currently the primary political program of the CCP. For all of these reasons, vote for opening government. I would like to thank to the Prime Minister and invite the Leader of the Opposition to continue. Great. Um, Claudia, can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Cool, thanks. Give me a moment. Right, cool. Um, starting in three, two, one. I'm going to forward three arguments in this speech. First, I'm going to explain why I don't think this will happen in terms of making the international currency. Second, I'll explain why I think this is up fundamentally bad for China um, in economically. And third, I'll explain why I think this hurts China internationally. First, why I think that this won't happen. Let's first understand the bar of proof that OG needs to make. They need to explain why they're going to be able to revolutionize financial systems that have stood for years and convinced all of the international community to switch over to the yuan, not the yuan, the yuan. That means that you need to relax controls beyond relaxing controls significantly. I also think this is also setting up entirely new systems and doing a, an incredible amount of legwork to motivate and convince other, other countries to act and with this new system. That looks like mandating that all your contracts are done in yuan. If not, you're not going to sign things like FTAs or renegotiating current FTAs to force this to be done in the yuan. If not, I don't think you're going to get the significant enough change on that side of the house. Five reasons why I think this won't happen. The first is that China in the status quo lacks its own finance and payments infrastructure. Contrast this to SWIFT and IFSC, which are incredible, which have already been able to like root themselves in banks all around the world. The degree of in of like 
entrenched advantage that these alternatives have is incredibly significant. Second, note that most Chinese firms even do their, firm, their funding in dollars in terms of the way in which they trade internationally. To ask all these firms to renegotiate these contracts, even independent of what other firms are going to follow, is a major loss already to your, the, eco the economy of China, which means that this isn't in their interest. Third, I also think that China just doesn't have enough foreign reserves to prop up such a broad currency because no currency is going to be able to do this. The way the Bretton Woods system was set up meant that it was through being the international currency that the USD was able to entrench itself. You are trying to undo 50 odd years of this and of this advantage in terms of foreign reserves, which you don't think China is able to do. Fourth, know that the Chinese yuan is already under heavy pressure from the BRI. It's already very expanded. Unclear to me why they're going to be able to then have the money, have the resources to commit to another major economic endeavor. Fifth, note that other countries in the status quo already don't trust China for a number of reasons. One, they have a reputation as a currency manipulator. You are not going to entrust your economy into the hands of a currency manipulator because that might in the future hurt you. But secondly, note that there is a high degree of resentment against against China. One, because the way they treated Ant and the IPO shows that the state is more interested in its security and purse and legitimacy than it is a free economy, which in turn means that countries are not going to work with China. But second, also things that like the Uyghur crisis mean that there's a significant degree of black backlash that is going to exist. If you ask all these firms to change towards the Chinese currency, I think it's just unlikely. The only reason for why this will work is he says that the US wants this because they don't like currency manipulation. Insofar as they really lived to it for so long, it's unclear to me why this is a tipping point. It will make them accept all of the harms of no longer being the international currency and therefore allowing this to happen. The conclusion you should draw from this is that OG has done very, very little work, even though Tin admits that this is what he needs to prove, to prove that the motion is likely to succeed. But second, why do I think this is bad for China? The first frame I want to acknowledge is something that Tin also acknowledges. The fact that China's economy is in a precarious situation. But I would posit that this means that China uniquely is not in a position to take this risk. At a point where it's even in access to international market, in Hong, financial market in Hong Kong is uncertain. At a point where its demography is aging, Huawei technology, for example, is not able to be sold. It's unclear to me why this is a point in time, at a point where China can't even set yearly targets in its five-year plans, that it should take on such a major, major risk. There are three reasons why I think this will hurt China fundamentally. The first is that I think this reduces the ability of China to export. And the reason for this is exactly because you can no longer keep the yuan low, you can no longer peg it to the USD, you have to allow it to free float. And at a point that this increases the value of the yuan, that means it's going to be significantly harder for China to actually sell their particular products. Um, the, the, the frame of this, incidentally, is a slowing domestic market that makes these exports all the more necessary. Even if in the best case, they increase the amount of exports for things like services, what they lose is your poorer rural areas who are no longer be able to sell their lower level exports. In a world where China is an incredibly weak welfare state, these people will suffer and these people will then be the most like unhappy with their lot and therefore maximally affect China's ability to be to have a stable political nature. The response that you hear from them is to say that they, this will increase your domestic Finances. This means understands the basis why China has a poor domestic economy now. It is not because they can't afford it. It is because culture of a culture of saving in Asian countries, number one, and two, the fact that China is a very nascent culture of consumerism, both of which mean that just because things get cheaper does not mean that you'll get a corresponding increase in the amount to which people are willing to pay. The conclusion to which is then that it's unlikely they're going to get lead to a net increase for the uh, Chinese economy. Second, you get less economic flexibility because you lose the ability to control the economy. The ability to control the currency is so important to China that they blocked Ant's IPO because of fear of how this would affect the ways in which they were able to control their particular currency. The implication of this is that on that side of the house, when you lose this economic flexibility, you lose the ability to react to crises, the implication of that is you're going to significantly worsen situation for China. Third, I want to note that this also is a major sticking point to the multinational deals that are able to work because other countries may not want to work with your yuan. Fourth, I also think that this hurts your ability to have transparency. This forces you to have transparency, not necessarily what China wants, in a tightly controlled country with tight control of information. There are two more responses I need to deal with from them. The first is FDI. Look, the reality is that China has been willing to trade off FDI in the way it treats Ant and Huawei, and that's because security is what's more important to them. Second, they said about, talk about bonds, but this is a problem for every single country other than the United States. And also, if China's economy is going to go down, the cost of bonds is also going to go up. There are two conclusions you should draw here. The first is that on the, the harm there that you risk is incredibly significant because the status quo is one is where China is just about able in the status quo to ensure this performance legitimacy continues for its, its people. Any risk to that and any hurt to that will drastically decrease the extent to which it's able to claim performance legitimacy as a CCP. But secondly, note that this also affects the ability for China to project militarily or international influence because they just don't have the great degree of money that you require. Until um, if China cares so much about controls, why have they been gradually loosening things like their exchange rate pegging? 
well, I think that's an incredibly an incredibly marginal approach that was done in order to like move to, away from sanctions. And I also think that the degree to which you're asking them to do this is significantly greater. I just don't think that's comparable. Finally, why I think this hurts China internationally. I think the frame that we need to recognize that what China wants is ultimately to defend the interests that it sees as core. That's why the BRI, for example, is mostly about the economic growth of China rather than trying to put to like majorly influence and remove the sovereignty of other countries. It's also why they prioritize strategic alliances to prevent security chokeholds like the access to the Indian Ocean. This doesn't stand in line with their interests. And there are two things I want to deal with. The first thing they say is that the UN will, will allow them to be independent from the West. First, I think that if you really want to be independent, you can probably ask BRI countries to pay you in yuan, insofar as this is like they, they are like indebted to you. I don't think this is something that is unique. But secondly, note that the claim that they're going to hold China hostage is ridiculous because this has never happened. And the reason for that is that there's an extreme risk if the US uses its position at the head of the finance system to hold other countries hostage, which means that its allies at the EU are likely to reject this vehemently, even within the US are unlikely to get political will for such an action. The implication of this is that on that side of the house, it's unlikely that this greatest harm will occur. One, however, all the benefits they say that exist for being a reserve currency are reasons why the US will retaliate against China with sanctions at the point that China tries to do this, which means on net, you're going to have a worse outcome for China. That is why we oppose. Thank you very much to Alo, and it's time for DPM to continue. Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> yeah, all good. Today's motion is not about starting a new trend. You can read it in the motion itself, which says continue pushing for the trend of internationalization. The reason why this is important is because what ELO has to defend is going back to the 90s and the 2000s, before the BRI, when China was sanctioned by the US every single time it tried to manipulate its currency, when it was labeled a currency manipulator and slapped with international tariffs when it had high capital controls and no FDI. The problem with opening opposition CEO is they have this vision of the world where China is doing very well right now. The reason it is doing well because of internationalization. That is what they meant. It's fucking fantastic and we're going to do it anyway. Three, why if it works, it's very, very good. And four, other associated political arguments. One, this is likely to work. The offense that we got from the LO here was just like shockingly incoherent because the bottom line is China has done all the things that the motion is saying. You know this because it's the info slide, but you also know this because every single point that the LO is making is something that China has already done. It's made currency swap agreements with 20 different central banks. Tin told you at the start of his speech that Chinese currency is the like third most, like the third largest reserve currency outpacing like the Japanese yen or any European currencies aside from the euro. That China has 10% of the world's foreign exchange reserves, which which is more than any other country except for the United States, which has like 16%. It's had joint ventures with SWIFT. It's denominating oil contracts in the RMB. All of the things that the LO says aren't going to happen just aren't true, because you also know that it's literally in the info slide. All the things that they tell you, I think are actually like very important. Like just consider this for yourself. Their argument was just China doesn't have enough foreign exchange reserves and there's no way this could happen. This is untrue. Not only do you know this not to be true, but just like into it for yourself. China is literally one of the world's largest economies. If the United States and the Euro can do it, I think China can do it too. The third thing to say here is about resentment. Here is the problem that opening opposition identifies. They're like, nobody likes China. Yes, the reason why nobody likes China and aren't willing to engage with them economically is because China continues to do things, or more frankly, continue to do things like put up high capital controls, subsidize its state-owned enterprises massively, and devalue its currency every time it wanted to increase exports. The fact is that China has stopped doing this, and it is decreasing doing this because China wants to negotiate and uses economic leverage with the West. The only thing that opposition should say here was just like, ah, but like the West really cares about the Uyghur crisis. I, I just don't think this is true. The vast majority of Western companies still do business with China because it, like, in spite of the Uyghurs, and the vast majority of international institutions are silent on the Uyghur crisis because they know half of the countries in the world are complicit in some form of human rights abuses, and China has more than enough power to keep international institutions from talking about this. I think the problem here is they needed to give you actual mechanisms as to why economically people were willing to say the Uyghur crisis is so important to the United States that we are willing to block all their efforts at slightly more internationalization. They just didn't give you anything to give with that. The last thing I want to say here is even if we don't achieve full internationalization, we don't need to. Nowhere in the motion is the premise that we need to access 100% internationalization, that we need the yuan to be the exclusive reserve currency for the rest of the world. I think that what we have right now and what we are continuing to push for is good in and of itself. That is to say, regardless of whether or not people accept China and whether or not they accept China as the reserve currency, 
all the things stated in the motion that China does to try to achieve reserve currency status as a good thing. When it liberalizes its capital markets, that means that more capital comes in. So when CEO, like also like CEO's argument about 70% FDI is just like untrue, like Chinese capital inflows totaled like something like $200 billion last year. Their GDP is $14 trillion. I'm, I'm happy to take back claims about this. Like it's in my batter file. I just think that like 1% of your GDP being FDI does not matter. China has like strict capital controls. I think any argument that says 70% of their economy is FDI is ludicrous. It doesn't matter. We want it to be more FDI. We think that more people should own more and should invest more in China. Because when people are willing to do that, when China liberalizes its capital controls, irrespective of whether or not it is able to access reserve currency status, that means more people get money, that businesses can start in China, that borrowing is easier in China. All these things are good. Second thing to say is this is the right time to do it. Um, irrespective of whether or not opening opposition is correct about whether or not China is dealing with aging crises, the bottom line is they've already started the process. They started this like 10, 15 years ago. You should keep continuing it. It's not starting a new process. You are currently literally continuing on track. Here is a counterfactual. It's so much worse because China has been doing this for 10 to 15 years. If you go with opening opposition and you just stop this in its tracks, you are actively reversing your economic progress at a time where, according to opening opposition, it is so important to keep going on the same track. That is why it is so important that you continue to do the sort of stuff that you're doing. The second thing to say here is in response to why this is a good thing. Opening opposition says, ah, but you can't respond to crises. I just think this is factually untrue. Guys, the US and the Euro have the largest reserve currencies in the world. We do not doubt their ability to respond to crises. TIN actually gives you really good reasons as to why you're more able to respond to crises. Here is the problem. It's the problem that's called original sin in economics, because the biggest problem with developing countries is they cannot borrow in their own currency because there isn't enough of that currency out there. China has tried to fix that by setting up markets of renminbi, by convincing people to trade with them in renminbi, by increasing the amount of foreign exchange reserves that are in renminbi. And this is great because what happens right now is simple. Whenever China wants to manipulate its currency or change interest rates in response to crises, that is to say, when central banks lower interest rates in order to stimulate domestic borrowing, the currency with respect to the West devalues. So if I'm an investor in China, I'm now materially worried about Chinese ability to pay back its bonds because most of them are denominated in dollars. And this is terrible because when that happens, I pull my money out of China because I don't think it's going to be solvent. I am much more likely to do this. This is literally how the Asian financial crisis happened in 97 because people pulled money out of Thailand, out of Singapore, out of uh, like South Korea. The only reason it didn't happen in China was because China was not liberalizing. It has faced continued economic pressure to do so now. That is why the next financial crisis is going to devastate it. See ya. You say that China has been doing this for 10 to 15 years, presumably then to push it from the already significant amount influence that Tim said this currency has, you have to do something extra. You have to deal with why you want to take this extra step and the risks no, that come along. You don't have to do extra stuff. We're just going to continue it. Like we're going to keep doing the BRI. Opening opposition said you can't do this in the BRI. I just don't think they understand what the BRI is. The BRI is literally all of the things that are stated in the info slide. That is to say, the way the renminbi gets internationalized is because we encourage more countries to buy our goods in the renminbi. So when opening opposition closes the LO by saying, ah, all we have to do is like, we have to convince more people to train the renminbi. Yes, that's our side. That's exactly the sort of thing that we want to do. It is very, very good that we get access to that because the biggest problem for China right now in the Belt and Road Initiative is transaction costs. It is the thing that is stopping them from getting more oil. It is the thing that is stopping their state-owned enterprises from taking over in different places. It is literally because it is very expensive and very risky for them to transact absent people having renminbi. That's why we like it. The last thing I want to say is quickly on borrowing. I think Ting gives you a very reasonable argument that's good as to how you shape domestic industry and we get little to no engagement with it other than to say oh, from opening opposition that China has a culture of safe. I, I think this is wildly an assertion. So just rest on the economic principles here. Ting tells you why you get more domestic borrowing spurred and why you get more consumption domestically, which means you don't have to rely on exporting to America that can sanction you anytime they don't like you. Very, very proud to propose. Thank you very much. And it's time for DLO to close the top half of this debate. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, great. Um, starting my speech in three, two, one. I want to firstly point out that the deep PM speech largely vitiates a number of benefits that come from the PM. And the reason for that is because if it is true that the PM wants China to be free of influence from the West and allow itself to be able to either A, dominate international trade, 
or B, not have to fear sanctions from the West, then presumably you cannot just continue the current trend of Chinese um, liberalization because it is insufficient for the Yuan to be able to be noted as the dominant global currency in the world today. And note that they need to take up this particular burden because it is a requirement for any of their benefits to work. If you just continue your current um, movement towards some level of liberalization, there is no capacity for you to be able to replace the USD. And that suggests that if the vast majority of the world still looks towards the USD as the global greenback, for example, the same problem about your bonds, for instance, the same problem uh, of having high interest rates, for example, the same problems of them being able to sanction you, etc., still uh, maintain itself, right? What exactly is the context that, we look, that we're looking at today? The first thing we need to note is that just because you manipulate your currency to an extent, i.e. to the sort of very extent to which China has sort of like ping pong around in the last five to 10 years or so, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you are completely at the mercy of the West. And, and that's like crucial to note. Because if all of the things that the OG says is true, and people largely still trade in the Yuan, that allows the Yuan some measure of a global force as a currency, which therefore suggests that China is at least to some degree insulated from the effects of things like speculation, insulated from the effects of things like sanctions and foreign capital exchanges and the like. The question then is, to what extent should China continue to exercise control over the Yuan and allow for its flexibility in its monetary policy? There are a few things to note here. The first thing then to note is that it is, I think, unfair for the OG to just claim we will continue relaxing our pact. And the reason for that is because China has very recently chosen to again re-manipulate its currency to ensure that appreciation does not go out of control. And note that this has always been a cornerstone of Chinese monetary policy in the sense that obviously, yes, they can to some extent liberalize when it suits their interests, when there's too much like national pressure on them. But ultimately, there is a need for them to be able to maintain the aggressiveness of the appreciation of the Yuan, precisely because of the varied number of domestic factors that they have to control. So the first thing that I don't think the side ever deals with is why is it that monetary control is more important for China vis-a-vis -vis international control of economic relations. The first thing is obviously that Chinese influence in the global market is not going to go away. And whether or not it's a global currency or global reserve doesn't necessarily like hugely change the amount of influence that they are able to exert, given that a lot of it has to do with one, flooding other, country, uh, other countries with like exports, which they require a low currency to do in the first place, but also to just militarily like posturing in certain areas like the South China Sea. So actually what is crucial to note is that domestic stability is also incredibly important for China and its capacity to project that power as an economic force. So why then is it that manipulation of currency is important? The first thing is because a lot of China's economy, as much as they're trying to move towards tertiary uh, services, is still largely based on manufacturing and production, including things like agriculture and primary exports. Uh, the issue here then is that at a point at which you allow for Chinese, the Chinese renminbi to continue appreciating without stock, this actually fucks over their own domestic producers the most, and this introduces significant influence stability at a point at which the local domestic population has, in, has increasingly created middle classes, for example, they are better able to understand what's happening in the world around them and agitate against Chinese dominance. So presumably, if you agree that China has a significant amount of capital leverage and foreign reserves, then there is no actual need for you to increase the amount of internationalization of your currency if at the current potential of its flexibility, it is sufficient for you to be able to balance against what your own domestic population wants and also what you are able to do in the international sphere. The second thing is just the context in which China is currently in. Um, it is true, obviously, that they were the ones who recovered the fastest from the virus. And that was precisely the reason why there was a recent increase in the in, in appreciation of the Chinese yuan. And that's precisely the problem. That is the reason why the People's Bank of China stepped in to reduce currency appreciation, precisely because such high appreciation of the Chinese yuan affects the, the, the foundation of Chinese economy, which is the exports that they require. Note that the way that the economy is structured is that they are largely able to survive off of domestic demand, uh, which is the reason why exports work pri primarily in China's favor in terms of their capacity to be able to earn additional capital I thought their own. That's why a lot of the bonds and FDI things are also not very important coming from the OG. But the next thing to note is why is it that we think it's impossible that they will ever be able to deal with the USD and become more important than the USD? Um, the first is that perception of China is not just about the virus or just about them being a currency manipulator. There are also like very serious issues with regards to like security concerns when it comes to like China being a world power. The fact that for a long time China is seen to have unfairly and disproportionately subsidized their own state-owned economy, something that Xi Jinping is never going to turn away from because 
because that is literally the hallmark of his entire economic plan and tenure in power. So presumably, what this suggests is that individuals across the world is not going to trust China to be the global uh, reserve currency in the first place. But then what are the trade-offs that we have to contend with in this debate, which is what OG doesn't deal with. The first thing to note is that this means that China, in its attempt to try and wrestle for power with the US, has to open itself to doing things like, for example, not signing FTAs if you don't do things in the renminbi, for example. Setting up things like the AIIB, where they attempt to funnel significant amounts of yuan to help developing nations um, in order to try and propel its currency to becoming more uh, important. Before that, yeah, I'll take one from OG. Go first. Nowhere in the motion does it imply that we have to destroy the US dollar. If it did, Tin already propped those policies in the PM. The problem with DLO is that they say that China relies on domestic demand, but they ignore all the arguments about how appreciating currency may hurt exports, but definitely increase the ability of Chinese consumers to have higher purchasing power. No, no, no. I, I don't think that's how like domestic consumption works. Um, domestic consumption literally works on the basis of your own people using the yuan to buy your own things inside. Like at no point did I say that they rely on imports to be able to survive. But also, I feel like you saying that you have a different stance on your PM and he propped a different motion is not necessarily helping your case in any way. Um, okay, moving on. Um, what was I saying? All right, okay. So um, I think that the next thing then to note is why is it that this is bad when it comes to transparency? I think the issue here is at a point at which the, that China wants is going to be so much more powerful. The trade-off comes from funneling massive amounts of money into things specifically like BRI, specifically like AIB, which I think only weakens their capacity to control that currency, which is again why reasons why you need to move away from internationalization at a point which require that flexibility. But lastly, I think if you become more important as a currency, you also open things like, for example, tra require transparency into your central bank's actions, which is impossible for the People's Bank of China to do, but also greater scrutiny into things like domestic investments, which is hugely problematic for China, given a number of white elephant projects can literally create for the sake of projecting economic power to the rest of the world. I think all of these things are bad and goes against the fundamental premise of China's po uh, power, which is mystery, conceit, and the capacity to control its own domestic population. Be opposed. Thank you very much, DLO, and it's time for a member of the government to open the closing half of this debate. Sorry, am I audible? Yeah, all good. Okay, um, I think it's been a bit of tussle on, on top half and especially on opening opposition about whether or not China needs to succeed in internationalization. I really just think if you look at the motion, it just says you should continue the trend of internationalization, which OG already points out. I'm going to go a bit further and explain why the trend of internationalization brings with it corollary benefits in terms of structural changes to China's economic system, which really benefits, uh, which really benefits everybody in the, in the economic system and is also quite good for China's international standing. Cut, bit of characterization first about why this is a uniquely good time to continue pushing, which will also deal with opening opposition claiming that because there's been no effect or minimal effect so far, we need to step things up considerably. This characterization and context will give you, like, will, will basically show you that even if China continues only what it is doing at the moment, it is likely to have a large and tangible effect in terms of how internationalized its currency becomes. First of all, it's a uniquely good time to continue pushing because European leaders right now are also critical the amount of power that U.S. wields with unilateral control. So consider, for instance, the fury that arose when the U.S. did like unilateral sanctions on Iran. I think quite a lot of countries, given the specific uh, context that we are in, are, are not particularly happy. The second is that countries are now seeing China as a plausible alternative, uh, especially in terms of promoting alternative payments. So you know, the digital economy, especially China's digital payments, has actually pushed more countries to see China as the you know currency country of the future. And you've got lots of countries, especially especially those in Southeast Asia, but also some countries in Europe that are trying to hop onto China's digital pa payments bandwagon, which also helps in the internationalization of Chinese yuan. The third thing is that deficit financing from the US, especially in response to the coronavirus crisis, has actually weakened the, uh, has actually weakened the position of the US dollar to a certain extent because people are no longer certain about how, sustain how sustainable this is. So those are three reasons why even if China doesn't actually change anything and keeps continuing doing exactly what they're doing, we will see shifts from status quo. The second thing I want to just note here is that 
Strengthening economic ties between China and BRI countries also prompt these countries to adopt RMB, primarily because half of the trade that goes on uh, in Asia is actually regional trade between China and the rest of Southeast Asia. And this is primarily done in USD, uh, which, you know, you lose lots of money on transactions and things. So there's lots of incentive to adopt as well. All right, couple of responses then, given this context to opening opposition. The first thing opening opposition tries to claim is that current measures are insufficient. Uh, okay, look, first of all, there's no need to internationalize tomorrow. I think we don't have to I, we don't have to assume that the CCP is going to do this in a stupid way. Second of all, there are already significant changes happening that have already strengthened the UN. Third of all, even if this is true, none of the benefits that we're going to bring you are going to be contingent. The second thing opening opposition says is that the, your own domestic producers are harmed. First of all, China is also trying to expand businesses overseas and to try and actively push Chinese businessmen to set up their own companies abroad. So presumably there is at least some benefit there as well to transacting things in UN. Second of all, appreciation has not harmed China's export especially over the past year, especially given that China has a niche in certain kinds of exports, such as medical equipment, as well as some um, co uh, s technological goods. The third thing I want to point out here is that even if there is some appreciation that harms exports, this is fine because it rebalances the economy towards a consumption-driven economy, which is explicitly part of the reason why the CCP was not actually worried about the appreciation of the Chinese yuan during the coronavirus crisis. Um, and so this is actually really good because it is now also cheaper to do commodity imports, which by the way, uh, was really difficult for China when the, when, um, when when commodity prices uh, rose as people kept um, their unlimited borrowing on US dollars, especially because commodity imports are a crucial part of China's export market. So we also get to fix that because we make it cheaper in some ways to get the inputs that you need for your export. So we offer a cost there. Last of all, reducing capital controls is also going to allow money to exit the city, which will also help mitigate this kind of um, th this kind of um, inf appreciation pressure that opening opposition is concerned about. Okay, so what are some corollary changes that are going to be useful for the domestic economy? And this works regardless of whether or not it gets fully adopted by the international community. China isn't stupid, okay? Successful internationalization requires certain changes, and the Chinese government recognizes this. So for instance, any push for internationalization, China recognizes will require trust and buy-in from the economic community. This looks like things like reducing corruption within the system, which is also a thing that aligns with the CCP's existing direction, and it also gives the CCP a pretext to liberalize the economy slowly without having to explicitly say that it is liberalizing the economy, because they can now frame it as a push to internationalize the Chinese yuan while still engaging in the kinds of loosening of capital currency measures that they want, but there might be some domestic pressure again coming from opening opposition. So on our side, we're able to show you how they can still engage with this and still get all the benefits of it, while at the same time not copying the political harms that opening opposition is discussing. There is, in fact, quite a lot of precedent for this. So, for instance, in the 2000s, uh, WTO regulations were used as a pretext for the CCP to push for agricultural reform. So, actually, this kind of liberalization under the guise of trying to internationalize uh, works actually fairly well. Okay, what are the impacts of this? First of all, I think that we can admit that we might cop some short-run instability, although I've already mitigated quite a large chunk of that, but we do get more long-run stability in the, uh, we do get more long-run stability. The international, um, the loosening of control on capital assets means that the market gets a better allocation of resources, you get more viable corporations and businesses. Given the tensions between the US and China so over things such as SWIFT, uh, it means that if we believe opening opposition about tensions, then it's good to have alternative facing systems. Last of all, this is also just really good for international credibility. Before that, I'll take opening opposition. Right. So the status quo is one where the, the like the status quo liberalization we talk about is one where the, where China has been able to reap some degree of benefit but still maintain the ability to control its currency. To attain the benefits that Goji and CG talk about, we are going to need to significantly increase the degree of liberalization, and that will cop the geopolitical harms and economic harms that we don't we don't think will be filtered. I really don't think that's true because a lot of the benefits we've been talking about look like things like slowly like cracking down on corruption within the domestic economy it looks like things like slowly loosening capital controls to cop even more benefits over time i don't understand opening opposition's obsession with insisting that all the benefits happen tomorrow last of all international credibility currency swap agreements are key for china in improving their image abroad uh, the, the ability to lock struggling countries out of global loans and things like that have made the u.s quite an internationally hated figure china for instance is 
able to do things like provide uh, currency swap agreements with Argentina, giving them the ability to afford imports when they were previously unable to do so due to their, uh, uh, due to their position in the, in, in the global economy as a risky loan. What does this basically mean? It means to take advantage of the unique international context to strengthen China's political position vis-a-vis -vis the US as well as other countries because they're actively able to use this as a way to get other countries on their side, um, become more likely to achieve political and economic uh, initiatives. Uh, and all of this is actually non-contingent on increasing what we're currently doing. It merely means that if we can continue doing things like currency swaps, the international credibility is likely to rise significantly, especially as the US is drawing away and is uh, reducing their engagement with the countries that are being left out of the global financial system. Very proud to uh, propose. Um, I think Claudia dropped off the call. Let's just wait for the chat. Just tag them to Discord. Hey, really sorry, but my internet dropped exactly when uh, Ella started to give the POI. Can we kindly back to this moment? I'm really sorry for this. It was 5.57 on my clock. Um, what was the last thing you heard? Uh, I literally dropped when uh, Sean started to offer POI. So if we can back to the POI and then you will have still a minute to finish the speech, if that would be okay. Sean, so I give the POI, POI again. I, can you pause while I try and like I crumpled my notes? Um, because I thought <laughs> I thought the speech was done. Um, but you just pause while I uncrumple my notes, okay? Sorry. Uh, yeah, just a second. I will try to join on my computer as well because I just uh, joined from the phone, but should be fine now. I will stay on the phone if that will happen again, so I will have access. That's, that's, that's. Um, so I don't have the POI written down. So I will try to approximate what I said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, it was something like... Um, okay, wait, 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 Sean, Sean, before you ask the POI, Claudia, how long do I have to speak after Sean gives a POI? The POI was quite long. It was like... Uh, one minute, because <laughs> uh, I dropped when it was 5.57. I'm really sorry. So okay. basically, you have okay, still cool. one, and 15, uh, one minute, 15 seconds. The last thing which I heard from your constructive was about there will be short-term instability, but okay. better allocation of resources. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Go for it, Sean. I have accepted and, your POI. And action. Um, <laughs> so we, the status quo is one, where China has been able to get some degree of benefit from liberalizing, but still is able to maintain a significant degree of currency control. On your side, in order to get the benefits that you and OG talk about, you're going to need to increase the degree of liberalization, which is then going to cop the harms that we argued geopolitically. Um, the process of liberalization does not necessitate drastic liberalization. I have given you some reasons why the CCP is likely to use this as a pretext in order to carry out the, some of the other liberalization measures they would have wanted to put in place anyway. So this actually reduces the kinds of domestic political backlash you get. But in addition to that, none of the impacts need to happen tomorrow. I think we can perfectly say, well say that the impacts only accrue in the long run. Last of all, another impact that accrues in the long run. Uh, community uh, currency swap agreements are a key for China in improving their image abroad. Uh, the US has the ability to lock struggling countries out of global loan systems. Uh, this is very bad. China can do things like give currency swap agreements to Argentina to allow them to afford imports where they would otherwise be seen as risky loans. This takes advantage of a unique international context to strengthen China's position vis-a-vis -vis the US and other countries, especially by help, especially because the US is currently drawing back from its international position. Uh, so we, China actually gets to step in to save all these countries that are already locked out of international economic and financial systems. And this is, makes them more likely to push for successful political and economic initiatives in the future, CG. Thank you very much. And really sorry again for the drop. And now I'm happy to invite member of the op to continue the round. Yeah, just checking that I'm audible. Yes, loud and clear. Oh, thank you. Um, 
Okay, I think Neo is exclusively to voice, so just interrupt me, but try to interrupt me at like five or like after five. Okay, um, sorry. Yeah, two, three. I'm going to be honest, I lost track in between about what was happening here, but I think the case that I'm going to put forward is fairly simple. The first is that the current economic policy that China is running within their country, because their domestic consumer spending is very, very low, about 32%, they're trying to run a dual circulation strategy that I think needs the complete importance that will help them strengthen their economy specifically, and I think should be the most important thing for China, and how this internationalization process is likely to weaken that. I'll start with OG and a little bit of rebuttal, right? OG says that there's decreasing trust in China, specifically just to the POI that I asked, I'm unsure as to why this trust has increased now. And they know that they don't give reasons for that. I will deal with CG in a little bit. Let me just deal with a few important things that I think uh, work out uh, that I need to rebut from OG before I get to my case. The first thing is that you're still likely to get foreign investment within the housing sector, specifically because it's 15% of the GDP along with infrastructure, which is 30% of the GDP in China. I think this is the highest, this is the highest industry that gives back greater within China, which is also why there are like ghost towns and things like that, it means there's a huge amount of foreign in investment within the housing sector, which is unlikely to stay, uh, which is unlikely to be affected whether or not you internationalize your commute, like whether or not you internationalize your currency. I think the second thing is that obviously 70% of the economy is an FDI. It is that the rest of the 70% of the economy that is functioning has contributions and highly dependent on foreign buy-in and FDI. So even if all of that is not funded by FDIs, they're dependent on FDIs and people to buy in on things like technologies and telephone or teleport, uh, teleport industries that China is dependent on. The second thing is that China is also going to increase the doubts that people have in them will do like huge analysis on this. Thirdly, I think they're continuing what they're already saying in, right? PM says that it's already significant in influence. It will be fantastic if they dominate the world. DPM says you don't need to dominate this currency, the most or like above the USA. Huge enough influence is okay. I'm unsure as to why this current influence is then not enough, given that Tim says that they already have a huge influence. That specifically also means that you need to be taking certain extra steps. I will deal with what ending says in terms of why you don't have to take extra steps to increase your influence in general. Uh, in general. And the last thing is that borrowing effects that you want to happen within the country still happen right now, specifically because A, people borrow a lot in the name of property tax because tax property rate is zero. So a lot of people still borrow anyway because a lot of the system, banking systems in China are shady, like shadow banks, like they agreed to, right? So I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, borrowing that currently happens in the country anyway. The reason why borrowing doesn't happen otherwise is because A, income taxes are incredibly high in China, which means that most people don't want more interest on those taxes when they specifically take more money out of the uh, government but also secondly social security systems are incredibly bad in china which means that more people live on meager means and spend more money into saving their future which is why also consumption is specifically low this is a specific reason why china launched the dual uh, uh the dual circulation strategy specifically because they want to increase this consumer spending they also want to increase the consumer trust within the economy and unless you are like uh, and unless you tackle the problems of things like income taxes and social security you're unlikely to get the benefits that oji wants because specifically you will have an internalized uh, uh, internationalized economy, but you're unlikely to be able to help the citizens anyway. Okay. Let's talk about framing. I think, yes, China is losing trust. Literally, the only form of leverage they have is the control that they exist. How do they have this control, right? Now that as per CCP's constitution, it is mandatory for any enterprise within China to form a party's organization and provide for party activities, right? So big tech firms are not an exception to this rule. So for example, Huawei has 300 party branches, Alibaba has 200, and Tencent has 100. Additionally, think like Jack Ma of Alibaba, Robin Lowe of Bayru, Oni Mark Tencent, all of these people are members of the CCP. Let's note on the second thing is that as per Article 7 of China's National Intelligence Law, because I think government is challenging the facts that I'm putting out, Chinese companies are also required by law to sh share all their data with the state. Note what this specifically means. All your big tech firms, corporations that currently exist within your country are your leverage because you don't have to share this information with other people. Note this is more of an extent explanation than opening opposition, specifically because we point out where this government is controlling this data from, i.e. the point at which you know how these tech firms work, these corporate companies and their economy is built on, you can manipulate your currency in a way that no other, other countries can because no other countries have this information about the financial regulations that work within big tech companies that ultimately rule the industry within the countries. Okay, next thing on why China is likely to lose this trust more. I think firstly, in terms of 
uh, the BRI projects that China is working on, I think there's a trend of BRI projects just stopping in most African countries. Secondly, I think there's a tra trend of China leveraging loans to other countries, the draw use of money by making these com uh, com countries dependent on them. Unlikely to know, unlikely why people would want to invest, like uh, engage with China in the first place. The third thing is the strength of yuan has been increased a lot because of its use, uh, because its use has been done in the trading and illegal selling of arms to rebel and extremist groups in the Middle East. I think it's hard to back such a currency. I think this is also why countries are very to back in things like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, specifically because they contribute to a higher level of crime. The third thing is that you increase alternatives for China. There are increasing alternatives for China in countries like Vietnam for industries like tech that are significant for Chinese industries because they're still cheap, right? I think there are multiple reasons of that. Firstly, you have low cost of production in Vietnam, but you also have things like tax evasion, and double tax agreements that exist in Vietnam that China's thinking of removing. I think there are multiple reasons why their people can shift their tech industries out of China than currently having influence. I think CG saying just because there were shifts in currency values means a current push will bring changes is unlikely because all these other barriers are still likely to exist, which will help, uh, which means that all of the benefits that CG wants to say probably happens, but only to a certain level, but the economy in China is likely to be bad. Uh, yeah, I'll take it to you right now. Even though we gave reasons why it's likely and propped harder policies like stop manipulation, we didn't need to fully achieve this to get our benefits. As we said from PM, attempting it means we borrow more, are better able to transact with the rest of the world, and are more insulated from crisis, which closing government literally repeats for seven minutes of their speech. Know the nuance. Yeah, I think you can revert closing government and my use takes a POI, but in general, I'm just going to talk about why the, all the benefits that you want can also accrue or come with just a stronger economy, right? Like, if you can still have better, like, debt facilities or, like, social security systems if your economy is stronger, which is why I think you should invest more in things like increasing the middle income and consumption within the country, which is unlikely to be increased with social security systems. What specifically internationalization does to the process of making your economy worse? A, A it exposes the entire financial banking system because internationalization will require transparency needs and deals. It is hard to control things than your financial institutions, but large corporations are connected to your political system. I think the highest scrutiny that comes in this process undermines other processes that China is doing to strengthen its economy by building better technology because that will raise concerns over tech companies and how they work, how there's government control in there and how they enhance the political control of the CCP. I think you lose international value in the international, in the international market that CG is focusing on in your key industries like tech and telecommunication, specifically because you have government control that you a, either cannot lose, because if you lose it, you lose control over your economy, or B, if you don't lose it, you lose your international value. Your internationalization is unlikely to go ahead without taking certain risks, but your economy also specifically gets explicit harms when you push for internationalization. Um, for those reasons, something you shouldn't do it. Thank you very much, and it's time for a government whip to start the debate on a gut bench. Um, oh, 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 I look awful. <laughs> We're just like, oh.
explaining why each of them is derivative in my speech. Um, and I'll start my speech in a few seconds. Okay, starting in three, two, one. Look, final, I think like necessarily, sure, we are babies in the debate of dinosaurs, but like our economic analysis and why it's like genuinely better to have a stronger economic plan, why you should invest those resources into firstly, propping up your domestic consumer base, because otherwise you having an increased ability to borrow doesn't really matter much when those people inside of your country don't really have incentives to borrow, kind of still stands. And although we're fair that like uh, some event analysis wasn't like fully rebutted, I'll try and cover some of it now why it doesn't make sense, we still believe that like the majority of the trustees extension still functions. Now on like CG's analysis, like necessarily I argue that like right now is the primary good time for like implementing this change. Like necessarily a lot of their analysis is like, oh, EU leaders are also criticizing China, like the US for its dominance. We don't necessarily see why they would side with China and undermining the US considering they're far more likely to dislike China. We don't necessarily see like why they're like belief in the like decrease in world confidence in the US due to deficit spending is like something that outweighs a lot of like, for example, O's analysis on like uh, people just generally not trusting China due to currency manipulation previously and, and, and like due to their own call like Chinese virus for COVID, et cetera, et cetera. But also for Shosti's analysis, no matter necessarily like the fact that a lot of these tech companies and everything else are trying to uh, necessarily have to provide the data to, to China, like this general mistrust is something that disappears on your side of the house, which is why like a lot of international community is willing to accept this change, right? Necessarily for Shosti doesn't just assert that the BRI in some cases is unfolding. She does provide examples because like there are cases in like Nigeria and Gabon and, and Zambia where like countries have canceled their BRI proposals, both due to protests and just like government mistrust that China is going to actually like contribute to it well and actually provide them a good analysis. So that like China's positions internationally is like fairly brittle, right? And necessarily making these changes can be a very high risk. Now, why is that risk not needed? We necessarily analyze that like it's better off if we focus on improving the domestic consumption habits and like trying to fix the issues already in the economy. We do so by precisely explaining to you why it's necessary to like focus on the dual circulation strategy instead, because of the fact that like Chinese consumers are typically like very much prone to like high savings and like investing in their own like domestic um domestic real estate bubble instead of anything external, right? So in the sense, these a lot of these consumers aren't going to be willing to make borrow like borrow internationally because like it's already ingrained into them that they need to see for the future. So they're unlikely to do like this excessive spending because they see it as risky, right? Necessarily we don't really see why this changes so much on the government side just because like the Yuan has like appreciated and so like international loans are slightly better. We think that like you can get good loans if you improve the Chinese economy in terms of like fixing consumer uh, consumer consumption habits necessarily and that will also provide you good loans. We don't necessarily see why the like idea of focusing all of these resources on these efforts of internalization and liberalization, considering the significant like pushbacks both governments can see it in terms of like domestic pushback and the fact that they never successfully analyze why like international communities or like other countries would be willing to trust that like these internationalization efforts will stay considering that China has been going back and forth on them, considering Prashasti's analysis from well, like the government influencing a lot of the economic decisions and like injecting itself like constitutionally into the operations of its companies is something that significantly undermines international trust. Like holding based on on all of this it kind of makes sense that like necessarily like the international community isn't going to be friendly to china's international internationalization so the best the government can say like they provide a status quo since we provide the analysis on why we can increase like it to better lengths by instead of refocusing those efforts onto dual circulations we think that that is superior uh, since it promised you can rise let's first say koji sorry go koji can you hear me yeah yeah i can hear you go speak Thanks. Uh, even if right now wasn't the ideal moment, DPM said that not continuing the trend and reversing course was likely to create instability, capital flight, and political volatility. All of that comes over the tenuous exports and big tech cases from off and beats the right time or different closing down. That's wonderful. But I don't think that's entirely the case either because like, I don't necessarily see why they would like fundamentally scare investors so much. Like considering like we don't necessarily have to say like like you make like such a massive drastic resource and uh, reverse into nothing. We think it's very easy for like China to mask it in terms of like, oh, look, the West is being mean to us. We can also be mean to the West and then focus on like, look, we're going to do internal investments and then we're going to increase the domestic consumption base. Insofar as international investors are going to go like, oh, fuck, these, these consumers are now actually consuming and like not just saving and putting it in a, re in a real estate bubble. We don't necessarily see why they would be so much like different on both sides of the base. We think they would be likely to like actually care about China even more and be more willing to invest into it considering that like it's 
more economically lucrative. Since like the you know, majority of the like government's analysis already stands on the idea that although China is seen as untrustworthy, it's a lucrative economic opportunity. By increasing the lucrativeness on our side of the house, we logically throw up their analysis on why like investors are still likely to do so, right? So I think this still stands. Like necessarily on like a lot of the other stuff that CG says, like they try to argue like against the domestic backlash point because saying like, oh, look, the Chinese economy is transforming. Yes, good, we want to encourage that. However, then they say like, oh, well, necessarily like exports won't necessarily be harmed because they're going to get cheaper input. One, this does not really rebut like OO's analysis and our own analysis on like the fact that exports like need inputs, right? And those inputs are like largely self-sustained in China because of its massive economic base and its massive like manufacturing base. So if like insofar as the like government we have tries to argue that like they're making higher tech exports now, so they're gonna need higher tech inputs, we think that's like analysis that harms your own case, considering that like that input is likely gonna come from your own manufacturing basis of like semiconductors, etc., which China already does. But secondly, that means that your higher effort like exports are now competing with like other high tech exports instead of like basic shit. So in that sense, I think it makes a lot like quite a lot of logic that like appreciating your high tech exports means you're now worse off at competing against Japan, Germany, or the US, meaning that those export bases are fundamentally harmed. And this doesn't really rebut the analysis of like whether what happens to like domestic agricultural exporters who do rely on the like low renmin rate exchange rate to actually manage to like successfully export. Because I'm running out of time again, go off CG. Um, so most inputs actually come from Southeast Asia, but if you are worried about appreciation, you are more likely to orient to a consumer-directed economy as well as crack down on shadow banking because you understand that if you want to internationalize, you need your currency to be trusted. So this gives the CCP pretext to actually continue some of the more beneficial liberalization policies that it wants to start uh, that it wanted started in the first. Mm, I think like on some level that might be like a roundabout way of like trying to like argue that but like we already gave you an analysis on why like it's still going to be untrustworthy and like why like international is not going to be as successful so insofar like sure you can say that like the um the CCP, if it's successful, can like manage to like use that as an excuse to further like crackdowns on corruption and so on and so forth. We don't necessarily see why it's going to be successful in the first place, which would give like the CCP a lot of leverage compared to like domestic backlash of CCP has implemented a policy that is not actually successful, and they're also like using that policy as an excuse to like further reforms of the economy. Considering the domestic base already dislikes that policy, we think it's unlikely that further reforms are really going to be that possible. Considering on our side of the house, we provide you a policy that like you can do things better, and like you also provide like. In, in general, just like better trust in your economy and like better trust in the consumer base, we think you're more likely to actually provide those reforms there, right? Um, I think that like further on, like uh, like quickly on OO, I think like by providing the analysis of why necessarily like the borrowing and spend, like saving analysis in our side of the house proves their impacts for a fair, fair bit better because it proves like why domestically there's going to be backlash, why like if business policies are going to be as successful due to like international backlash as well. We also provide analysis on tech companies and so on and so forth. So in all of those senses, we provide you more analysis on why OO's impacts actually work out in terms of like this liberalization policy causing significant downturns in terms of like the Chinese domestic economy and the Chinese international standing. But all of that being said, thank you all for the debate. Oppose. Uh, thank you very much for this round. We would like to ask now everyone to leave the room, uh, including the streaming, and we will call you back in, I hope, 15 minutes. Max Puente. Wait, was this being streamed? I don't remember.